Well, um, we are in the middle of a series, or actually wrapping up a series today, called It's Personal. And this is a series that is about you, and it's about me, it's about our church, and it's about our community. It's about the people that we love, specifically the people that you love. We've been talking about this idea that um, we've been invited to follow Jesus, and um, that that is a very personal invitation. I don't know if you've ever felt like personally invited to follow Jesus Christ, but he wants you to follow him, and that, that call, that invitation, it's very personal, and um, it is a series that we've been in for the last five weeks. If you've missed any part of it, I would love for you to go to itspersonal.church, and you can catch up there. You can watch the messages. You can kind of get a sense of this whole campaign and where we're headed with this, but if you're new here today, this is actually a fantastic Sunday for you to be here. Because we're going to talk about um, kind of the behind-the-scenes stuff at Access Church. You're going to find out a little bit about what makes us tick. You're going to learn what's important to us, what drives us, what motivates us as a church. And um, it's our hope that when you hear us talking about this, that this would resonate with you. Because we believe that um, the God of the universe has invited us to share a message that is all about love and hope. And we want you to experience a message of love and hope today that is not just for you, but for our entire community. And we're pretty fired up about it, so I can't wait to share it with you. But just to give a quick review of where we've come from, we talked about week one, this idea that um, following Jesus will cost you something. But the real question is not what it will cost you, but what will it cost you to not follow Jesus? That we think that, oh man, God wants something from me. And maybe you're here today, and maybe you're a little bit skeptical by nature, and you're like, "Uh uh-huh, see, I knew it. That's the thing about religion. That's the thing about church. They always want something from you. And that is a real tension that we live in. It's this idea that salvation is free, and it will cost you nothing. But to follow Jesus means to walk away from the things that we think are valued, that we perceive as valuable, and to, to wholeheartedly follow God. And so we looked at this story of how some of the first disciples, including Peter, began to follow Jesus and what it looked like for them to walk away from everything and to follow Jesus. And then the next week we said, you know, what do you want people to line up and thank you for in eternity? If our lives are temporary, if eternity is forever, if the only thing that lasts in eternity are people, what does it look like for us to invest in our eternity? What do you want people to line up and thank you for in eternity? That was your homework, to go home if you're single, to find a friend and talk about that, think about that. If you're married, to talk about that together, um, talk about that with your kids. What do you want people to line up and thank you for in eternity? And the next week, we, uh, we had a big stack of money here on stage. That was fun. And we said, look, our temptation is to lean into our wealth, our lean into our riches, or to place security in what we've built up for ourselves. But we, we talked about going home and writing this on our mirrors or our dashboards and to say over and over again, I will not trust in my riches, but in you, God, who so richly provides. That when we lean into the giver and not the gift, that we're on solid ground. It's when we lean into the gift, when we lean into the stuff, when we lean into the money, that things start to shift for us. And so it's much, much better to lean in to God. And then last week we got real practical. We talked about what it looks like to talk about money at home in the context of marriages, what it looks like to employ a very simple strategy to give first, to save second, and to live on the rest. And as long as we keep those things in balance, then kind of everything else um, follows suit after that. And Along the way, while we've been talking about this on Sundays, I've also been having a number of conversations with a whole bunch of you during the week. And um, just the other day, Steve Wood called me, and he said, man, I just wanted to talk to you for a few minutes because I am so excited about this campaign, and I'm really excited about turning in a card on Sunday. And as we began to talk more about what they were so excited about, I was like, Steve, would you and Angie be willing to come up on stage on Sunday morning and talk about this a little bit uh, with everyone and just share kind of what God's been teaching you about giving and what um, it has meant for you to strategically support Access Church. So here's a nice picture of the woods at the beach with their son, Ethan, um, who's sixth grade, right? Fifth, fifth, that's right, about to start middle school. About, we've had these about to start middle school conversations. <laughs> right. um, and uh, we just baptized him a couple months ago, so that was a lot of fun. And um, so this is the woods. Make them feel welcome. 
Thank you. First of all, uh, how long have you been at Access Church? It's been a few years. I remember back at, in our University of North Florida days, you guys running the two-year-olds in Wombaland, like... No, they ran us. <laughs> I think I think the church had started about six months or so. Uh -huh. I mean, it was seven, 2007. So you, I know you know yeah. better than I, but yeah. that was shortly after. That is awesome. Well, yeah. we are so grateful, and it's been so fun to kind of um, run alongside you guys and to be a part of this. Where do you guys live in Jacksonville? Yeah. We, we live, um, I guess, Harbor Woods off of uh, Monument, kind of on the north. Mm -hmm. Fort area. Carolina area. Yeah. 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 How many churches do you think you pass between your house <laughs> and here? Oh, boy. That, that's a great question. A lot. Can I just go there? There are a lot of churches. None is good. Pass. So, <laughs> so we got to keep this moving quick, but I know that because I know I'm about to open a can of worms here, but like... What would cause you, why? Like, why drive past all those churches to come from up at Monument all the way down here to go to church? Um, what is it that just keeps you coming back to Access Church? Yeah, the, you know, it, another good question. We feel though the church is really kind of our GPS and, and beacon for our path forward. We really enjoy the people here, but it's been an investment in what we're building. It's our family that's been extremely valuable to us. So that value we're receiving, we certainly wanted to give back, as you mentioned, uh, obviously through our giving, but also in our when we are able to volunteer and do, do the things for the church that help other people find the kind of values we found. Yeah, how about you, Angie? It's the environments created for our child and everyone else's mm -hmm. that keep us coming back um, and great relationships that we formed over 12 years. Yeah. So we talked pretty openly on the phone the other day about, you know, this whole give, save, live thing and that you guys are willing to stretch and take another step, which is just so, we're so grateful for that. Um, what, for y'all, like, has that just been a way that you've always lived where you've given first and saved second, lived on the rest? Or has that been, has it been a difficult thing for you? Kind of how, how what's your process or, or your story been like to kind of get to a place where giving is such an important priority for you? Yeah, I think um, we, um, back in six or seven, we really began thinking about how is this going to work for us and what is our responsibility. And when you really put it in the context that you've given it to us, which is so God's providing for you, he's just asking for his part of that to continue to grow his kingdom. So we began thinking about that and, and we built on it slowly over time. Uh, which really brings us to here. And the crazy thing is so much has happened that would affect that, that we've literally fought off and said, nope, we, we can do this. And 17, Angie came to me in the fall and said, got this really big idea. And uh, yeah, I was like, okay. So uh, we, we talked about that last week. Yeah. Whenever it's, let's talk, right? Whenever your wife says, let's yeah. talk. Uh, so the big idea was I want to invest in our family. And by doing that, that means I need, I want to retire. So we had this plan to retire together and, you know, walk off in the sunset and all that sort of thing. But now um, she really brought to me a real value statement that said, I want to invest in you. Or was that a sales job? I want to invest <laughs> in you, our family, and Ethan, our son, and take that time to really invest in him now rather than us in the future, which is saving and investing in the things we do. And so in March of 12, uh, March of 18, Angie retired. And at that point, we're like, okay, what, what does that do to giving? And that's a huge part of our income. So we made the decision to leave it where it is, even though the income had dropped. And I think I mentioned to you, you know, I'm this guy that would rather be on a tractor, you know, plowing peanuts than working in a business. But, you know, the amazing thing is we sort of turned it over to God. I know I did, and I know Angie did. And the raises that have happened, the bonuses that had never, ever occurred in my 30 years with this company, all of a sudden began to happen. So we've actually been able to increase in her retirement, mm -hmm. which for me, I'm telling you, sometimes I, I told Rich, I'm in meetings and I say stuff and I'm like, 
that sounded good. Where did that come from? I don't even know where, well, who, where is that? And it's sort of like God showing up in your life, and he has provided for us in ways that we've been able to help other people, even in situations that maybe we felt stretched. So we're looking forward to this because the return Angie's big idea has been a great return for us. I mean, I've certainly gotten the benefit. Ethan's grades are better than they've ever been. He's doing really well in school. She's happier, from my perspective, she can speak to that, that seems happier than she's ever been. So Which makes you happier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we have, you know, I can go home for lunch. I mean, it's a great thing. But the thing there is... Don't, don't overshare. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there, there's also... Well, it's only once a week. <laughs> so the, so the, the, the thing is that, you know, we, we've gotten value in two ways. Uh, building our relationship, our family, and Angie adding a lot of value to that, and, and the monetary side of that. But, guys, if the monetary hadn't showed up, I'm really happy with the intangible parts of what's been given to us. Yeah, we, we talked about that because it, you feel like, you know, you, when you share your story, and Stephanie and I have similar stories, where we've stretched and we've taken a step to give more, and then God has shown up in some really tangible ways. And I'm always afraid to share those stories because you don't want to make a promise to someone else that you're going to get some tangible reward. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it is like he knows that we need, we're, we're children, and we need yeah. some real tangible reminders that he sees and, um, and he honors our sacrifice. Yeah, and, and I couldn't say it any better than you. Obviously, that's why you're up here. But the thought would be, <laughs> the thought would be that um, if you've never done it, and it's a step, um, you should consider that step, mm. the values and, and how God shows up when you begin to take those steps, I think, will truly amaze you. Mm. And those opportunities are amazing when you see them and you go, how did that happen? Oh, Oh, I did. I took a step, yeah. and I would encourage you. The size of the step is not as important as begin to take the walk. If you begin to take the walk, these things sort of become more natural, and and they become, in a way, uh, uh, you really begin to understand. Okay, the values I'm going to receive by doing my small part to what has been given are far outweigh any less lunches we take or less, you know, toys you might buy, those kinds of things. So I would encourage anyone, start taking those steps. (laughs) Good. Thank you guys so much for being willing to share. Guys, say thank you to Angie and Steve. This is, uh, it's been an interesting series because I know for some of us, the idea of talking about money in church for several weeks is a difficult one. And some folks, you know, have been like, man, why, why do we keep talking about money? And um, that's because you're feeling an internal tension, right? You feel an internal tension about um, all the financial responsibilities that you already have. And then this is something that you're just wrestling with. You're not sure if you're ready to let go of this. And um, meanwhile, while you're asking me how much longer we're going to talk about money, there are other people in this church, many people like Steve and Angie, who say, we've got to talk about this more often. We've got to talk about this more. And the reason they're saying that is because they have taken a step to trust God with their finances in a significant way, and then they have seen God show up in their lives in tangible and intangible ways that have been significant for them, that have grown their faith, that have stretched their faith, that have helped them to trust God more in other areas of their lives as well. And so those of us that have taken that step already, we just want that for you. We really do. We want you to have that kind of experience in trusting God. Now, if you're new to Access Church, we want you to know that we are for you, that we are for St. John's. That is, um, that's what we've been saying around here uh, for a long time. And um, matter of fact, about three years ago, we started saying this on a regular basis, getting t-shirts to say this, to say that we are for St. John's. But the phrase is kind of an interesting one because about 10 years ago, St. John's didn't even exist. St. John's wasn't a thing. If you lived on this side of County Road 210 10 years ago, you were just in Jacksonville. And if you lived on the other side of County Road 210, you were in Key West, I think, or no, St. Augustine. 
right? And matter of fact, when we first moved here 14 years ago, we, there was nothing out here. When we first moved here 14 years ago, we had to come in covered wagons. You guys remember this. If you've been here for a while, how many of y'all have been here longer than 10 years? Just show of hands. Not too many folks been here longer than 10 years. And um, so, and, and there's like, this area has changed dramatically. When we first moved here, um, people didn't have GPSs back in those days. At least we didn't. And we didn't have smartphones back in those days. And so I went to the gas station up here by the highway, and I went to buy a map of the area. And I saw a map that said Jacksonville. I was like, okay, that'll probably cover it. And I opened up the map, and it stopped one exit north of here. It's like, that's not helpful. So I got the St. Augustine map, and I pulled that out, and I opened that one, stopped one exit south of here. And I realized then that we live in no man's land. Like, you could get from here to Julington Creek, but you'd have to go, like, out to the river and take a boat, and you could get eaten by crocodiles, you know. It was, it was a little bit treacherous back in those days. There was no red lights on Canada Road 210 when we first moved here. Um, Publix and Winn-Dixie had just been built. And some of you, my neighbors, have told me stories about how you'd have to go to Old St. Augustine Road to go grocery shopping and all that. Uh, you know, it has been a little bit of uh, a thing to see this area just grow and take off. It's crazy now that we don't even think about the fact that we can just bop over to Home Depot and it's so close by. And so more people keep moving here and more homes keep being built and this area continues to grow. And three years ago, a group of people said, you know what? There's so much happening in this area. Um, we need to think about what it would look like for God to show up and to say to this community, I love you, I am for you. And the reason is that even though all these people show up, like why are all these people coming to St. John's? We're all trying to accomplish the same thing. We're trying to accomplish the American dream. We're trying to create a better future for our children than maybe we had growing up. You know, there's A-rated schools, there's beautiful neighborhoods, there's beautiful golf courses, and it just seems like, hey, this is a great area to move to, this is a great area to raise a family, and so more and more people keep showing up here because we're trying to create a really special community, and we want to be a part of that, right? We want to be a part of creating a really incredible community of people. But then you get here, and in the beginning, it's great. You get to know your neighbors and all that kind of thing, right? But then you realize that there's, there's a few people maybe on your street that are a little bit quirky, a little bit unusual. You ever had that? And then you decide, you know what? I really want to be a part of this whole thing. I'm going to go to an HOA meeting. And then you find out there's a lot of quirky people that have moved here as well, right? And you start to recognize that it doesn't matter how nice the neighborhood is, it doesn't matter how beautiful the golf course is, like there are broken people everywhere. There are people that are in pain, there are people that are hurting, and they bring their pain and their hurting with them. And you know this because you bought this great house and it has this beautiful view, and then right next door to you, someone builds the garage mahal. Right? It's got like the most magnificent in-law suite above the garage and all that, but it completely blocks your view. Or maybe your neighbor decided they were going to do a she shed out back, and you've got a she shed going on next door. And you think, what is happening around here? Like, this is why we need an HOA, right? And then you find out, you send your kids to these A-rated schools, and it gets a little more serious. Because now you recognize that even though your kids are in a great school, that even the best schools still have bullies. And that even kids who are going to really great schools can feel alone and lonely and depressed. And when you have a 13-year-old or a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old that's feeling levels of stress and anxiety that break your heart, and they talk about feeling depressed and not wanting to leave the house, you, your heart breaks and you realize it doesn't matter how good the schools are, we still have a problem. We still have pain. We still have brokenness in our lives. And, and then you realize at some point that it doesn't matter how beautiful your home is, how well landscaped your yard is, how great the floor plan is, but when your marriage is falling apart, when that person that you've decided to spend the rest of your life with says, I don't want to live here with you anymore, the pain is real. And then you start to feel the financial tension and the financial pressure of having moved to a community like this where you feel like, my house has to look a certain way, my cars have to look a certain way, I have to dress a certain way, my kids have to be in these year-round travel sports that cost a fortune, and all of a sudden the pressure and the stress of the bills begins to add up. And the pain and the stress and the anxiety in this community is every bit as real as what is felt in any other part of town. 
And so recognizing that, a group of people several years ago said, we want to be for St. John's. Because St. John's needs hope just as much as any other part of town. St. John's needs a solution to this problem of anxiety and worry and depression as much as any other part of town. St. John's needs to know that the God of the universe is for them just as much as any other part of town. And so two years ago, we launched this church right here at Liberty Pines Academy, and it has been an incredible experience to create a church in this community with you. And you've been fantastic, and you've invited your friends, and you've helped make this a unique place, really. Because what we said was, St. John's doesn't just need another church. St. John's doesn't need an average church. St. John's needs a really special kind of church where anyone can belong, where everybody can be welcome. We want to create a place that would just inspire people to follow Jesus. That was our idea from the very beginning, that we would just inspire people to follow Jesus. You can't make anyone do anything, but we want to be followers of Jesus. In other words, we want to be willing to just walk away from everything else and follow Jesus. And as people who've chosen to follow Jesus, we want to inspire other people to do that. And that's because Jesus told us to do that. In fact, the very last thing that Jesus communicated to his disciples, the very last thing he said before he left this earth was that we should go and make disciples. Now, we don't use that word disciples a lot, but what that word basically means is people who would be followers. In fact, what it meant to the first century Jewish people is if you were a disciple that was usually used related to a rabbi, it meant that you followed so closely behind your rabbi that the dust from his sandals was on your clothing. That you had the dust from his sandals on your clothing because you were following right behind him. And, and we just said, wow, God has told us. Jesus has told us to make disciples, not just to be a disciple, not just to be someone who follows after Jesus, but that part of following Jesus is to invite other people to follow him as well. And this word is really, really important, follow, because a lot of us grew up thinking that somehow being a Christian, somehow being in church, somehow being a part of this whole thing is about knowledge, that we should be smarter, that we should learn more. And Jesus said, no, 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 just follow me. We'll figure out the theology thing along the way. Jesus didn't have any kind of educational prerequisites for following him. He didn't quiz anyone on their Bible knowledge. He just said, follow me. Sometimes we grow up in church and we think, man, you know what? It's all about performance. I've got to behave well. You know, if I can just kind of get my act together and be gooder, then I can follow Jesus. And Jesus showed up and, he, and Jesus, honestly, he invited people that were not behaving very well at all. People that had nothing in common with Jesus loved to be around Jesus. And so we said, hey, if we're going to recreate that today, if when we gather together as followers of Jesus, if when we gather together we actually are the body of Christ, then that means that people should feel about us the way that they felt about Jesus 2,000 years ago. And 2,000 years ago, people who were nothing like Jesus loved to be around Jesus. They followed him from town to town. People that were not behaving well, who didn't have their Bible knowledge figured out. And we said, what if we could create a church where, you know, everybody would want to be a part regardless of where they were on their spiritual journey? What if we could just inspire people to follow Jesus? So there's some things that we set out to do when we first began this church. First of all, we said, we want to make Sunday the best day of the week. We want Sunday to be so much fun that kids would actually wake up their parents on Saturday or Sunday morning and say, let's go to church. And much to your chagrin, that is happening in many of your homes. Your kids are waking you up on Sunday morning and saying, we want to go to church. It's the best day of the week. We wanted to create a church that would be fun, where kids would feel like it was okay to wear their Halloween costumes to church on Sunday morning, where the band might start with a song from Journey, because we don't take ourselves too seriously, even though we take Jesus very, very seriously. We wanted to have a church that would be fun and would start your week off right. We wanted to create a church that was for everybody, where you could actually belong before you believe, where you could show up and you could be part of community, where you could be part of strategic service, even while you're asking questions all along the way. 
where you could say, I want to be a part of this. I'm excited about this. I have a friend who is constantly posting on Facebook, inviting his friends to come to Access Church because he's never experienced anything like this. And I know that he has not yet made the decision to follow Jesus, but yet he's inviting other people. And that's the bullseye on the target for us. We said from the very beginning, what if people could show up to Access Church? And they don't believe everything we believe, but they have such a great experience and they feel so loved that they would want to come back the next Sunday and they would want to bring a friend. What if the teaching that they got here was practical? What if the teaching here actually made a difference in everyone's life? Not the kind of teaching where you walk away at the end of a Sunday and you go, oh, that was deep. That was deep. But what you really mean is, that was confusing. I didn't understand anything that he said. No, we said we want to have teaching that's practical, that makes a difference in our everyday life. Teaching that is so simple that we can all understand it, even if it might be incredibly difficult to put into practice. But if we could put it into practice, it would make a tremendous difference in our relationships, in our workplace, in our communities. We said we want to actually come alongside parents, and we want to partner with parents. We want to create environments for kids and for teenagers that are so much fun and they're so exciting and they're so helpful that kids would want to come back every single week and that they would want to invite their friends. We want to create a place. Well, I think of the, um, the story, one of my small group families. We're in a Stephanie and I are a small group. And uh, one of the families, they've got a little boy. And like every little boy does at some point, he got upset with his parents. And so he packed his bags. He decided he was done. He was running away. And like many young boys, he had not, or men, they don't always think things through all the way, right? Our plans aren't always thought all the way through. And so he was a little bit caught off guard when he's on his way out the door and his mom stops him and she says, to where will you go? And he's caught off guard. He hadn't thought that through. And then he looked at her and he said, I'll go to Upstreet because they love me there. Oh, that every kid would want to run away from home and go to church, right? Do you remember when you were a kid and you packed your bags to run away from home and you were like, I'm going to church, right? No, you didn't say that, did you? But you have done an amazing job. You have created environments here through your investment financially, through your service and your time, through the ways that you love these kids and high-five them in the hallways. You've created an environment here that kids want to be a part of, and you've done something even more significant than that. You have partnered with parents. You've said, we believe it's not the church's job to raise these kids. It's your job to raise these kids. But we want to come alongside you and give you practical, helpful tools. And so it can be things as simple as the the placemats that we give young families in Wombaland or the take-home kits that we give from Upstreet where we say, hey, this is what we talked about. Here's how you can talk about this at home. This is what hooked Stephanie and I. This is why we wanted to be a part of this family of churches. Because when we were raising young kids, we needed help. We didn't know how to take our faith and pass it on to the next generation. But we knew that we wanted our kids to walk so closely behind Jesus that the dust from his sandals was on their clothes. But we didn't know how to do that for them. And this church came alongside us and helped us raise our kids. And this church helped us to raise young adults who would say, I want to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. And we are so grateful to this church for that. And we're so hopeful that that will be an experience for your children as well. That this is a church that will come alongside you and say, we want to give you helpful, practical tools to raise your kids. And then we said, you know what? All this stuff is great. Sundays are awesome. But on Sundays, we sit in rows and we face forward and there's a better way to do life. That we can grow in our faith when we get in circles. And we talk about what it looks like for our faith to grow, what it looks like to take these messages that we hear on Sunday morning and apply them in our everyday life. And so we said, life is better when we're connected. And circles are better than rows. And we came in front of a bunch of you years ago and pitched this, and some of you were like, well, I've never done it before, but I'll give it a shot. And so you gathered together in circles, and you began to create communities that have just been phenomenal. You have saved marriages. You have helped bring prodigal children back home. You have loved on each other in such incredible ways. Our small groups are the churches within the church. It's there that we pray for each other. It's there that we cheer for each other. It's there that we take meals to each other when we need it. It's there that the one another's of the church take place. And we are so grateful that you've helped us create this kind of church. And then we said, you know what? We want church to be simple. 
because these people are busy people. And they've got a lot going on. And they don't need to feel guilty because they're not at church every single night of the week. But it was more than that. We actually believed that the church would be most effective when the doors are locked, the lights are out, and the parking lot is empty. Because we believe the church is most effective when the church is out in the community. When you're at your kid's soccer practice, that is the church in the community. And we wanted to give you the time and the freedom in your week to invest in your neighbors, to invest in your family, to invest in your coworkers, to care about them, to love them. And then when they have need in their life, when that pain that is there in their life becomes evident and they talk about the fact that they hope, they need there to be something more to this life, you can say, come with me. Come with me and begin to follow Jesus. I have found a place where I can discover Jesus. I want you to come and to see him too. And you have done such an incredible job with this. And the last two years here at Liberty Pines has been really awesome. And this church has made incredible strides, incredible progress. And we're so grateful for all that you've done, the ways that you've served, the ways that you've given. But we want to do so much more. We feel like this is a time in the life of our church where we could say, hey, you know what? We could just kind of keep going, same pace, you know, growing a little bit every year, getting a little better at this every year, making our environments a little bit more fun every year. Or we could just press down on the gas pedal. We could accelerate. We could speed this whole thing up. And we could begin to communicate even more loudly to our community that the creator of the universe is for you. And the creator of the universe has great plans for you. You were designed to be a great parent, and we want to come alongside you as a church and help you be incredible parents. Where, the, where this church can come alongside our community and say, we want to help meet the needs of some of the most broken in our community. We want to show hope and help and healing. And so you've come alongside us and you've done an incredible job, but we have said over the last few weeks, what would it look like for us to surrender everything to God, to live with open hands, to come before God and say, God, I just want to bring everything before you. I want to surrender everything to you. I want to give you everything, even my finances. And for some of us, that means the giving that we've been doing for most of our lives. Stephanie and I have been giving a priority percentage of our income since we were in college. So for some of us, it means stretching our faith again, stretching our faith a little bit more, giving a greater percentage this year than we've ever given and saying, God, we're going to give more. And we don't know what that looks like, but we know that you've never left us without. For some of us, it means taking a step to maybe give for the very first time. Maybe you've never given to this church. Maybe you've never given to any church. And maybe it's a big deal for you to say, I'm going to trust this church with my finances. I'm going to trust God with my finances. And I'm going to allow my faith to become very, very real by stretching and trusting God. And we would love for you to take this next step with us. Because guys, if we do this, if we do this, this community can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the creator of the universe is for them. If we do this, we can create better environments more fun environments, more exciting environments for every single one of our kids and our teenagers. Environments that they want to be a part of and then they want to bring their friends back to. So that they can build relationships with other kids who are also chasing after God. Other kids who are saying, I want to be a follower of Jesus. We want to create environments for them that are fun and helpful and exciting and practical. Environments that you can trust as a parent. And then, and then we said, you know, we want to also do some amazing things right here in our community. And there's several community organizations that we partner with right here. One of them, for example, is the Homeless Coalition for St. John's. Believe it or not, there are homeless families in this community. And there, are, there haven't been in the past homeless shelters that can take families. And the Homeless Coalition said, we want to provide a place for families to stay together even when they're going through the season of, hope, of homelessness and help them get back on their feet. And so we've partnered with the Homeless Coalition for the last couple of years. You all have been incredibly generous to them. But we said, what if we could turn up the volume on that? What if we could give even more money to 
for the Homeless Coalition? What if we could give even more money to 6-8 Ministries, our partner in Costa Rica, that is doing so much to reach some of the poorest people in the world and show them the love and the hope of Jesus Christ? What if we could turn up the volume on all of that? And so this is a very special Sunday for us because this is a Sunday where we get to come together and to say, man, I'm going to take a step. And I, I don't want to just coast. And I don't want our church to just coast. I don't want us to just miss the opportunities that are in front of us, to love this community well, to love our kids well, and to love people in Costa Rica well. I don't want to miss the opportunity to take advantage of whatever opportunities God might have in front of us as a church. Because we've said for years around here when it comes to discipleship and investing in other people that um, sometimes it's intimidating, right? When you feel like I'm supposed to um, build up someone else, when I'm supposed to invest in someone else, when I'm supposed to make a disciple. And that feels like a, a really big thing because we're like, I don't know. I don't know if I can fill up their cup. So we've used this metaphor around here for years to say, when it comes to investing in other people, it's not your responsibility to fill someone else's cup, but it is your responsibility to empty your thimble. God has given you experience and expertise and wisdom over the years. And whatever that is, it might just be a little bit but whatever that is, God calls us to pour that out into someone else's life. And that same principle applies with regard to our finances. That this is an opportunity for us to empty our thimbles and to come before God and say, God, I don't know how big the cup is. I don't know what kind of opportunities God's going to put in front of Access Church in the next two years. I don't know what land opportunities are going to come up. I don't know what opportunities for a permanent facility are going to come up. But God, I'm willing to surrender my finances to you. So that when that opportunity comes, we will be ready as a church to say, God, I don't know how big that cup is, but I'm going to empty my thimble. And maybe when we all empty our thimbles together, maybe that fills the cup up. Or maybe that comes to two-thirds and we say, God, we need you to step in and fill this gap. Because we're leaning into you. We're trusting you. We're living with open I do not want you to miss this opportunity. I don't want you to see stories of life change shared on this stage in the next two years and for you to not know that you were a part of making those stories possible through your financial giving. I don't want you to miss out when we do get a piece of land or we do get a building and we start clearing that land or building out a building and, and you to say, man, I wish I had taken advantage of the opportunity to be a part of that from the very, very beginning. We want this for you. So we're going to give you an opportunity here in just a moment. The band is going to come back out. And um, they're going to play a song here at the end. And there's an opportunity for each and every one of us to, uh, to fill out a card. There's cards there on your um, seats. And um, the, the card is pretty simple. Start at the top with what your normal giving has been like at Access Church, and then what your new level of giving might be. And this is important for us to do together, to celebrate together, so that as we total these up and we share the results with you two weeks from now, that we can say, look what God has done in this church, to encourage one another, to say, I'm not the only one. There's others that are coming alongside, and we're going to rally together, and we're going to do something really exciting in this community. And so we would ask you to take this step. Stephanie and I took this step three weeks ago. We filled out our card three weeks ago. We've already turned ours in. Our staff and elders have done the same thing, but we're gonna do it again today because we're gonna stretch even more. We're gonna, we're gonna increase our amount from even what it was three weeks ago because we have been so inspired by your stories and what you've shared. And so we're gonna take another step today and we're gonna go first and we would invite you to do this with us. So the band is going to play for, for just about a minute and um, just give you time to pray and to think. Maybe if you haven't filled out a card yet, this is your opportunity to fill out a card. You can stick it in one of the envelopes that's there on your seats as well. And then when, um, when the band begins to sing, Stephanie and I will come forward and we'll put our card in first. And then we would invite you to come forward and to place your card in the basket as well if you're ready to do that. If you've already done this, many of you have, many of you have been so excited about this campaign that you've already turned in your cards over the last couple of weeks, but I would ask you to do it again as a demonstration 
as a demonstration to those around you that you are all in and that you're excited about what God is doing here at Access Church. This is an incredible opportunity. This is a chance, not just, listen, the win success for us is not getting a building. We've had a building. We left the building to come here to inspire people to follow Jesus. That's the win. To create a church that would change an entire community's mind about church, and by doing so, about God. That's the win. That's the opportunity in front of us. I hope you'll join us. I joked a minute ago about deep, what it means to be deep. You know what deep is? Deep is in over your head. Deep is when you can't touch bottom. You want to go deep in your faith? You want your trust in God to grow? You go into the deep end. And for many of us, that's what this represents. I know, it's a very tangible, rubber meets the road moment of going into the deep end and saying, God, I'm leaning into you who so richly provides. I'm putting my trust in you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for taking this step of faith because that's what this is. It's not about money. God doesn't need your money. He wants your heart and your attention. Thank you for being willing to give him that. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for giving us the ability to give generously. God, I pray that you would take this offering, you would take these sacrifices, and you would use it in this community. Use it in the lives of our kids and our teenagers. Use it to, to work in our marriages. Use it to, to draw the prodigals back home. Use it, God, in the lives of those who haven't been in church in years or maybe ever to come back to a relationship with you or to begin one for the very first time. God, use this not for our church and not for any one of us, but use this for your fame and your glory in this community that an entire community of people would say, I don't know if I believe what those people believe, but I sure do love the way that they love. God, this is our love gift in your name. And we ask that it would make your name famous in this community. We ask all this in the name of the one who died for us, Jesus Christ.